Mr. Jackson. Good to see faces. Hi, Barb. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. All right. We are, uh, we're going to get rolling. I had, a, I had a small disaster this morning, so we'll talk about how we pivot uh, and what that, what that looks like when things happen. So yesterday, uh, my phone started acting a little wonky. Um, people would send me pictures and I couldn't download them, things like that. Um, and then I would try to call, you know, and you'd hit, hit the call button and nothing would happen. And that was yesterday. And I was choosing to believe that it was um, the network. Uh, and uh, today when I woke up, I couldn't return text messages. Uh, when someone called, I couldn't answer the phone. Uh, it, was, it was fun. So I got to go to the Apple store this morning, uh, which was just not part of my plan for Monday morning. Uh, but I literally just got finished and like, you know, slid into home just in time for this to, to get started. So, um, okay, so today uh, I would love to talk a little bit uh, about being a realtor versus being a business owner. Um, and I think that, I don't think, I know that with the things that we've experienced over the last few months, um, hopefully we're all starting to realize a little bit more um, of how we need to be structured as a business. Um, so realtors tend to look at the next transaction, uh, you know, or the next thing that's, that's in the pipeline that's coming up, whereas business owners, um, they look at the next five years, you know, what's, what's it going to look like five years from now? So the question I have for you all is, are you structured like a business or do you feel like you're structured more like a realtor being like transactional? And there's no right or wrong. There's no judgment here. Just what, what are y'all's thoughts around that? I feel like a realtor. I'm not really clear on the whole business structure. I mean, it really is tough because yeah. you've got to think about the next deal along with the five years. You do, because the next deal is what pays the bills, right? Like that's the thing, you, you rely on that income. So yeah, no, I get it. And I mean, literally, Lisa, 90% of agents, that's how it is. You know, it's just, that's what we have to focus on. And it's what we do. It's just figuring out how to do both um, or how to get the right people in our world to help us do both. Um, anybody else? Joe, yeah. I know you have a good crew in your world. Yeah, it's, you know, if I really looked at it, I probably don't need to work, okay? but I have a hard time getting structured for the next five years because it's not the money, it's the deal. It's helping a buyer, it's helping a seller. That's where I get the thrill. The money is secondary. Getting my people to grow so they can make six figures, that's real important for me. Yet you get in there and you get ingrained in the deal and you're going like, well, I'm a realtor. I'm working on the next deal. Even though the next deal doesn't make or break me. You see what I'm saying? Oh, it's for sure. That's what, the, that's what most people get caught up in. It's addictive. Yeah. You know? The next deal is just like, oh, I want to get that listing, you know, where I know I, I probably, you know, unless I live to be 95 or the economy totally crashes, I probably don't need to work. Well, and that's the, it's, it's the instant gratification. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that microwave society that we live in where we want to, um, you know, you want something much quicker than the, roasting option, right? So it is, it's that instant gratification. It's feeling like you made a difference, uh, whether it was, hey, I helped this family get into a home or I was able to negotiate this deal or make money, right? It's that instant gratification. Um, for instance, when I was in the mall today and there, and there aren't any realtor shops in the mall, uh, but as I walked into the mall to get to the Apple store, I probably passed, I don't know, I'm gonna say, 12 shops um, and at least five of them were closed like shut down shelves cleared out 
this is this location is permanently closed. Um, why do you think that is? Well, because nobody planned for this crazy whatever. Yeah, nobody nobody planned for COVID. Um, and I mean, one of them was New York and Company. So I mean, that's a pretty big clothing store. One of them was Motherhood Maternity. Um, you know, there's still people getting pregnant. People still have to buy clothes, right? Um, but then you had your other stores. There were some other stores that, that were fine and were still open. Um, and it just made me think because I knew this was our topic for today. And so as I'm passing by all these clothes, I mean, all these shops that were closed, um, you know, my wheels were just turning. And I thought, okay, why did this store stay open and this store closed, right? Soma was still open. They sell bras and panties and pajamas. And they, they were open. And then you have New York and Company that sells all types of clothing and they were closed. And I thought, and so that kind of got me in the mindset of the units versus volume. That kind of got me thinking in, in those terms because um, I feel like New York and company, everything's always on sale, right? Like I feel like the, if you've ever seen that shop, everything is, there's always something, 40% off, half off, buy one, get one half off, buy one. And so the volume necessarily didn't necessarily matter um, or the, I'm sorry, the units didn't necessarily matter because the volume was lower. And so I thought, okay, if I were insulating my business to recover quickly from COVID, to get ahead for 2021, whatever the case may be, I think I'm going to start focusing a little bit more on volume. I'm going to go for probably a little bit higher price point, uh, maybe farm, different neighborhoods, uh, that type of thing. Um, and that's just a little side note. But it was very interesting to me that some of these shops that have been around forever were closed, but a bra and panty place could stay open. So somehow they have insulated themselves, right? Whether that is on a corporate level um, where they take care of their stores, trickle down, what have you. But somehow this tiny little place has managed to stay in business when other people are closing. So um, why do you think, what, what would be your thought process behind that? So, and, and putting the correlation into real estate of, of just, I need you to start thinking why, okay? What, what do we think has caused that? Yeah, nobody had planned on it and it did happen and yet we're here. So why are we there? Um, and then the next thing that I wrote down, um, who has a five-year business plan? Has anyone ever sat down and created a five-year business plan. Okay, so, I, and again, no judgment. I, I did this because I was uh, new into the team leader role and I had a child that was about to go to college. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm a little late to the party, but I need to get a business plan in order because I need to know that, um, because once I have one kid that's in, been to college for three years, then I have another one going. So I knew I needed a strong five-year plan for what that was going to look like economically for me um, in my business. And I started hiring accordingly. Um, and then I moved and that all got <laughs> cut off and stuff. <laughs> but that was the idea, right? That was the um, knowing what the plan was, getting ahead of the game on who I needed to hire instead of waiting until I was, it was too late and I needed to hire them. Um, who has just a one year? Did anybody put together like a business plan for 2020? Mm -hmm. Good. And then did you all revise that at all, Joe? Did you all have to go back since COVID? Have you made any revisions to that? Actually, no. We went back and we did a 90-day uh, challenge for May, June, and July, a number of transactions we put in contract. We're not going to hit the lofty goal of 73 in contract in three months, but we're going to hit probably 60. We reviewed numbers through June, I've got to really dig into it deep. We're actually ahead of where we were last year. Not Good. by much, but we're ahead where we were last year. And so if you just listen to everything on Bold Pivot or what Gary said last Monday, you just have to double your activities. Yeah. You have to realize is that half your competition 
have dropped out. Oh, they have. And, and I want to, I'm going to come back to that, doubling your activities. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, how do you all think the virus has affected real estate? Whether it's how you all are thinking, what's actually happening, what the consumers are thinking, how do you think that this has affected real estate overall? Barb. Oh, unmute yourself, babe. Um, you really have to educate your people because um, I think for a while there, they thought the uh, real estate business had stopped. They had no idea that there were so many buyers out there that were qualified and that things were rolling pretty well other than being safe and smart and careful about how you're doing things. Um, I, I still get questions now. How's the real estate business? And then I said, it's great. <laughs> Want to buy or sell today? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a great time. But it's true. You've got to educate them to that so that they know what's going on. So true. Nancy? Yeah. Here, let me unmute myself real quick. Oh, you're unmuted. You're good. Okay. I've been working with some first-time buyers um, a couple the last six weeks and they have a special needs son who's five and we bring him along to every showing and the challenge is is that they're in the 250 to 300 range and they want to be single family home and they want to be in like Dublin or Worthington schools or possibly Delaware so I'm showing them houses every possible listing like between 250 and 300 we've made two offers but of course that when we went 11-7 over and waived repairs and offered 3K to the appraisal gap and paid some of the seller's closing costs and still wasn't enough. Oh my gosh. And then that, so that was a hard loss two weeks ago. And then um, Friday night, I had to, we saw a FISBO so that they had wanted to see. So I had to schedule an appointment and do the um, buyer broker agreement prior to seeing it, get the sellers to sign it, showed up at the FISBO. They said that they had six offers just from that day, the FISBO. Oh my gosh. For, it was a 305 listing near Smoky Row, so in Powell. And so they said my buyers wanted to make an offer. So I had to race home, right? This was this past Friday night, write an offer at nine, nine o'clock, rush it over. And then we could only go up to 307 and, and offer good, the same competitive terms but they immediately texted me and turned it down and said they had a more aggressive offer. So, and then we went and saw a couple more houses on 4th of July. And one of those I found out just now from the listing agent, there was 28 offers on a 249 house in, it was on Weatherstone. So it would be uh, Worthington Schools, Columbus, Texas, just a basic track home. For wow. 249, there was 28 offers. And so now I'm wondering, should I just tell them that one of them we saw on Saturday had 28 offers or I just worry they're going to get discouraged? I mean. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they are going to get discouraged. I mean, you know, I'm feeling discouraging for us and it's not even, you know, well, we aren't even involved. Um, but I do think, oh, Joe. Well, why don't you do this? Why don't you go to the four neighborhoods that they made an offer on? Get mm -hmm. some postcards. I have a buyer for your neighborhood. If you're considering selling and don't want to go on the market, uh, allow me to show this buyer, you know, write down what they want, write down mm -hmm. their situation. I would not mention the son because mm -hmm. that's right. Family sure. rather. Just go, go see, listen, there's, there's, if there's one home for sale, one of the 20 homes around it is going to come for sale in the next one month to a year. The people move about every seven or eight years. So go do a postcard campaign around the neighborhoods. They would go, I have a buyer for this home. They made an offer on John and Sally's home at mm -hmm. 123 Main Street, but they didn't get it. Would you consider an offer on your home for someone who moves, wants to move in your neighborhood? And find the product before it hits the market so you don't have to compete against 28 offers. Right. A good deal. How does the mojo dialer that we have work? Can you call? Uh, can you call in the neighborhood? I don't know. I mean, have any of you all used that? 
No, but I, I have a slide broadcast and I can pull the phone numbers from White Pages Premium. You can yeah. make calls like that and kick out a call and do it with a postcard. I mean, I was going to say I would do both. Mojo works too. Yeah. Um, Kim? Yes. Another idea is, um, which happened for me, there, I would also look at temporary off the market because um, I've been calling this uh, realtor for months and it's temporary off the market, temporary off the market. And this is a higher priced house. But finally, I got him at the just the right time and he allowed my clients to see the property and they knew what the value was and they wrote it at full price and we got it oh good it wasn't even on the market good. why was it off the market like why what? was it off um the the first couple times it was on the market they weren't really serious and they were a lot higher and then her husband passed away and oh, then they she decided to take down some wallpaper and paint and stuff like that but it was it was timing Okay, well, that's another idea. I could appreciate any ideas <laughs> after this last weekend was rough. Well, Russell. yeah. I mean, and the thing is, is I think you're definitely not alone in all of this. There are so many people that are in the same position right now. And it's what, what can you do to educate them, to prepare them? So I would definitely let them know there were 28 offers. There was 28 offers, offers on the yeah. one or three that we saw on the fourth. And that was the one they didn't like. They, and then I had <laughs> the wife like one and the husband like the other. So we ended up not writing on the other three. But and then Friday night, I mean, who would think a FISBO would get seven offers over yeah. less than one day? Just yeah. in the one day. Yeah. They listed it on Zillow and they were showing it just for one day in half an hour increments. And I, I said, did all those offers come from buyers with buyer agents? And they said, yes, all of them did. Wow. So, so, so even with that, and we're thinking, if we're talking about, okay, how is this affecting the business and what's going on? Um, well, interest rates right now are smoking. Stupid low. Mm -hmm. Stupid low. So I'm having that same conversation with my sellers because they need to know what the interest rates are. These people who are thinking about waiting, how much money is that going to cost them as rates tick up a little bit, how much is it going to cost them on that end, right? So just be aware of what's going on. It's like an overall education process when you're having these conversations with people. Um, anyway, so just, just a few ideas. What do you all think the long-term effects of this are going to be? When we're talking about creating a five-year plan, what do you think the long-term effects of COVID are going to be? Because I don't think we've felt them yet. When you, when you look overall, like right now, I think there's a whole lot of um, dog paddling going on. Like we're all kind of still keeping our heads above water a little bit. Um, but what happens if we have another round? What happens if we have to go back into lockdown? Hell, what's gonna happen when school starts in August and kids aren't going to school? Or they're just going two or three days a week and now parents are trying to figure out how are they gonna work? Are they gonna be able to work? Uh, are they going to be homeschooling kids, right? What does that look like? Are they going to want to put their house on the market? Probably not. And I think we're going to start to see some short sales um, because when they are unemployed or furloughed for a very long period of time and they have got nothing to pay the mortgage with, that's when it's going to start to hit. Right. And it can happen to anyone. I, I don't think we'll have short sales because people have equity. I was there in 08, 09, and I saw people buying houses in 05, 06 who were clueless and got two 28 loans fixed for two years, then 28 and adjustable, got bad subprime loans due to a greedy mortgage lender. Sure. Okay. People now have equity. I don't think we may see some short sales. We won't see anywhere the amount we did before. But yeah. what do you think it's going to look like? Like, no, we may not see short sales or see as many of them, but what do you think it's going to look like, Joe, when some of these people who are trying to hang on to their employers, uh, and so let's just say someone bought 
one of those houses that Nancy was just telling us about, right? And they bought it above list price, right. no appraisal, no it's right, like no inspections. The air conditioner goes out, they lose their job. Yeah, like this is what, try not to be negative Nelly here, but these are real life scenarios of what's gonna happen. And so we just need to kind of look ahead and think of what is all of that gonna look like? And how can I best educate myself so that I can educate my consumer? Right, like what do I need to do to make sure that my people have the absolute most information that they possibly can have? So yeah, I, I do think that we're gonna see some people that have to sell because they don't have a choice. Right. Again, if you're contacting your people and staying in touch, you're gonna be one of the first ones to know. However, if we continue to have this shortage on the market, let's say somebody bought in February and they both lost their job and their, their, their uh, forbearances ran out, they don't have the money to catch up, there's still somebody who'll take them, who'll get them there and get them out and get them out. Right, right. And they're not gonna be like totally underwater on it. They're no, I get that. Underwater or short yeah. or they, you know, they could hang on for nine months till they get a foreclosure. I, I don't know. I don't look at this like it is an 08, 09 because people have equity. But well, and the lending situation is very different. Um, right. I agree, yeah, I, I, think, I, I think the same. So, so just if, if you all could answer, and this is something that I'm gonna ask everyone to answer. Uh, Cherie gets a pass, uh, but everybody else has to answer. Um, what are you not doing right now? What are you not doing um, that if you started doing it immediately, you would be able to increase your business, if not double it for next year? What is it that you're not doing right now? Like for instance, for me, it's being consistent. I am not being consistent right now. So I know that the consistency of that lead generation, that compound interest, right, that, that adds up, that would make a huge difference in my business. So I started. What else? I was gonna, I was gonna agree with you, Kim, being consistent with putting myself out there and making those calls and those postcards and all those campaigns for people in there. So I've kind of just need to get better at that and do it yep. more. Thank you. What else? I'm horrible at time blocking. I'm okay. so bad. It's just, I go down one bunny hill and the next. <laughs> the beautiful thing is you don't have to be great at all of it. We're, we're, we're going to touch on this. Okay. So I have consistency and uh, consistency and time blocking. What else? I'm a combo of a little bit of those. It just, it feels like the, um, if I would just get back to getting everything done before noon or one, yet there's also been a lot of Zoom calls and Zoom meetings and Zoo Zooms and <laughs> So I did, again, it's it's the consistency and getting it back to get and get just getting it done before get it done before noon or yeah one. yeah no for sure what else oh I can't hear you Catherine I can't hear you Kathy you're muted. Oh, I can't hear you, Kathy. I'm sorry, you wanna type it in the chat? Thanks. Who else? Be brave, be brave. What's something you're not doing that if you, you know if you started doing it, it would make a difference? I'm not doing the videos that I know I need to do on Facebook and okay. on YouTube. Okay, you've been doing them. You did a great Those one. Those are all dated. I haven't done any in a year. Okay. Well, see, I don't know the difference. That goes back to that perceived reality that we've talked about on social media, right? So just getting it out there. It just doesn't matter. Get it out there. So Susan wants to do videos. Who else? I guess, um, taking off what Susan has said, what I have done in the past 
and we're not supposed to do now is I go to a lot of meetings and a lot of groups and go to luncheons and functions and show up at sporting events and just talk to people. Well, you can't do that now. You kind of can do that, but you shouldn't. You just got to be real careful. So maybe if I were to do more videos and post them out there, because I was doing some, and even though they weren't great videos, I was getting good response. Maybe if I did my, my, my being out there and talking to people on a video via Facebook, you know, that could fill that void. Yeah, absolutely. So I think if anybody else have something, even though I asked everyone to share and some of y'all are just sitting there all like this, it's fine. I have one. I still love you. What, Susan? <laughs> I started doing the DTD4. Okay. Like right before and right as we went into bold. And everything that I have on the marketing contract came out of those calls. Like not because they said, oh yeah, I'm ready to list. It's because they were thinking of me and they referred people to me. Right. That's awesome. Because that's how it works. Right? That's how it works. I think people get so caught up in just like what we were saying at the very beginning uh, of the session of thinking transactional and, you know, what's the next deal and what's coming up instead of that long term compound effect that it can have. Anybody else? So I feel like when we talk about these things, um, part of it is we don't really know where to start. Um, or we don't really know how to do it. Uh, or there's, I mean, there's definitely always something else that we'd rather do than that. <laughs> I think that's part, part of the issue. Um, and so, uh, because I mean, lead generation is always going to be the answer. One of the things that I wrote down in here was that your lead generation model, you need to have your entire model be, um, have it all in writing. Uh, and what did I say? Oh, your plan needs to be based on all of your business coming from your database. So that's just like your whole plan, right? Everything is just, we're gonna pretend like we're gonna lead Jen as if every single piece of business is gonna come directly from our database. It's not uh, the postcards or the calls that you make uh, or the farming or any of those things. We're gonna just write our plan as if every bit of business is coming directly from the database, meaning how many times are we contacting these people? What are we doing? And I think that if we have something in place, right? Something in place that we love to do that we'll actually do or that we see uh, the benefits from, then I think we'll start to do it consistently. It's just like brushing your teeth. Nobody has to remind you to brush your teeth every day. You just, you get up and you do it because it's a habit and, and if you don't do it, no one wants to stand near you that day, right? So you do it. So um, just like when Lisa said, I'm really bad at time blocking. Well, then don't do that. Focus on what you're good at. Like you have to time block to a certain extent, but does it matter? I don't care if you make two phone calls this morning and two phone calls sometime in the afternoon or you call somebody tonight when you're on your way to pick up dinner and you make a, a quick call then, right? Like I don't care when you do it. I don't, I don't care if you don't do it from eight to 11 every day, I just care that it gets done. So I think that we get so caught up on thinking it has to be a certain way or we have to do it a certain, whether it's videos that need to be new videos, right? Or whatever it is, we get so caught up that we just don't do it at all. So, I mean, for me, I kept thinking, oh, you know, I gotta get my Twilio set up. I gotta get my Twilio set up and it's set up now but I haven't created the plan in, I mean, I like, I like pictures. I like something visual to go out. So the fact that Twilio is just like tech stuff, I don't really use it at a super high level. Um, and I don't know how to use Avocado because my admin did that for the last three years. And I needed something to go out, right? Like I needed something for Father's Day. So it was literally just like Bitmojis. I did the same thing at Easter. Um, I just created a little, thing like on Canva or something that was just uh, a, a happy Easter from the Buckners, from our family to you, or, or from our family to you or something like that. And I sat down and I texted it out to like 80 some people. And it was exactly what Susan said. Every single thing that I have going right now came from that text message at Easter. So instead of saying, oh, well, my Twilio isn't 
doing what I want it to do and my avocado isn't working, I just, just find another way. Just find another way. So don't get caught up on, oh, it has to be this, or if I, if I don't do it a certain way, I'm a failure. Um, just what, what are some other things? What are some things that you all have done that work? Where do you get your business? Where'd your business come from, Lisa? It's fall from the sky into your lap. Oh, you're muted. You're muted. I can't hear you. Sorry. Um, there. Uh, my dog was hitting my hand um, when I was trying to unmount mute. Um, okay, so a lot of it has, there have been a couple past clients, stuff that I had in the works before, um, you know, just things that took a little bit longer. Um, I got three new buyers in an open house that I did. Um, so two of them now are in contract and yes, it's below $300,000, which is like, you might as well have a club. Yeah. Done to win. Um, yeah. Just, just being there, being present because they needed help, um, finding a house. So open houses are not as bad as people think they are. Yeah. So, but I mean, if it's something that you're good at and you've closed, you got two out of three of them, girl. You know, like focus on what you enjoy and focus on what you like. Like we've just got to get out of the box of feeling like we have to do X. And if we don't do X, then we're going to fail. We need to focus on what we do really, really well and just do that. And then if along the way we can figure out how to maybe time block an hour here or there or how to get a video scheduled to go out at a certain, whatever, great. But if we focus on the things that we do really well, that's going to produce results. But I think we get caught up in our heads that we aren't doing something right so that nothing gets done at all. Am I way off base on that? Can you at least nod your head no? Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Do you want Lisa? The problem is we get in our own head. And that, I know that's my problem. I got like drunk monkeys up there. Oh, hands down. You get, down. you get frozen, frozen mm. in time. You do. It's paralysis analysis, analysis paralysis. That's it. Analysis paralysis. You know, like overthinking it. I can't get it done right. So then just nothing at all happens, right? Um, who can tell me the five jobs? What are the five jobs of a realtor? You all have heard this, I'm, I'm sure, a bajillion times. Some people are newer. Maybe you haven't. What are the five jobs? Lead generate. Joe's got one. What's Be another one? Almost. Lead follow up. Negotiate. Go on appointments. Brian's trying Script to say. Practicing. It. Kathy said negotiate. And what did you practice. say, Kaylin? Script practice. Script practice and role play. Those are your five jobs. Lead gen, lead follow up, go on appointments, negotiate contracts, scripts and role play. So we know the lead gen piece, right? We know what we're supposed to be doing and the lead follow up piece. What if lead gen was, I'm going to get on Facebook. And I am just going to interact with 20 people today on Facebook. I'm going to go through first all the birthdays and send a cute, don't just like, right? Type and send a message. Uh, and then I'm just going to scroll through a few people and I'm going to keep track of who they are, right? And let's just say Karen Smith is, is somebody that I'm friends with on Facebook. And I went in there today and said, you know, oh, Karen, glad you all had so much fun this weekend. It looked awesome. You know, miss your face. Then I'm going to go over to command and I'm going to make sure Karen Smith is in there. And I'm going to make sure that I have all the information that I need to have for Karen Smith. And then I'm going to go back to Facebook and I'm going to scroll a little more and Barb Schaefer had something phenomenal that happened this weekend and I'm going to comment on it and I'm going to like it. And then I'm going to go over to command and I'm going to put Barbara Jean in there, all the information, make sure I have everything that I need about Barb Schaefer in command. I'm going to put her on a little, maybe a bi-weekly neighborhood touch because I've got her home address in there. That's something that you can send out now. You don't have to set it up. You don't have to do anything. You just start it, right? What if you did that? That's your, that's your lead gen, guys, 20 times a day. Lead gen, lead follow-up. It's something, right? You're contacting, you're talking to somebody, you're communicating with somebody, and then the follow-up piece is putting them on that neighborhood touch plan. So what if, what if social media was your job? Instead of this guilty pleasure that you have, what if it's now something, but 
do you see where I'm going with this of just thinking outside the box and stop being so hard on yourself? You can do things a little differently, guys. It's okay. And it's a guilty pleasure that you can make money from. <laughs> Anybody have luck with that? Who, who does that you feel like somewhat consistently? Nobody? Karen, I know you were doing videos. Susan was doing videos. I've seen I, them. I do, um, Kim. I mean, that's part of my, on my, like my A's in my database are kind of in a, and I got from my coach like a 30, every 30 days, text them. The next 30 days, make a comment on Facebook. And then the next 30 days, calling. So you're calling them every 90 days, but then in between, you're also doing that. So, and yes, I say I'm pretty consistent with that. Yeah. So, and then like Jacqueline and Meg, you all were, um, when you went to stage a house, you had put some stuff on social media about that. Super cute. She put a little cute post on there about Tug. And, and yes, it was all about Tug, but she was talking about going and staging a house, right? So she's, she's got that in there, stuck that in there a little bit, that that's what it was over. So um, one of the, and I don't even remember where I read it or saw it this weekend, um, but they said, what if you videoed yourself doing home improvement projects and sent it out to your entire database as a such? And I thought, okay, Karen, you've got all those videos from Facebook. What if you started just once a week, sending those out to everybody in your database? I know we're all working on our houses. I know we're all doing things. Here are some things, right? Instead of just putting it on social media, go the extra step and send it out to your database. Like I had recorded a couple of videos. Uh, Meg was talking about doing some stuff at the events committee and that cribs thing and whatever. And I had recorded a couple of videos and I was like, oh my gosh, I need to send those out to my database. They're fun little tips. They're things people like to see. Uh, Bree did a really cool one. Do you remember Brie? <laughs> the door. The, the door. door was the coolest. Yeah, that was so cool. And why couldn't we, like, I don't mind sharing my, it was a mantle that I sanded down and a wood beam, like a barn wood mantle thing. Um, I don't care. You all can have that video and send it to your database. Hey, here's a quick little DIY on a mantle. I don't, I don't know anybody in Columbus. You all can take it and use it, whatever you want to do with it, right? Um, I can snag Bree's or Karen's or Susan's or whoever's videos and send those to people in my database. I'm just giving them information. It doesn't have to be me doing it. You Bree does want to be TikTok famous, so that is a goal well, of hers. So, her, so please. Let me just tell you something. TikTok <laughs> is the devil, all right? I'm just gonna, I just want you all to know that right now. If you're thinking, huh, how can I waste two to four hours of my life today? Just sit down and open up TikTok and you just poof, it's gone, just like that. I mean, gardening tips. But seriously, it's a great thing to use to be able to send those things. My son is a catcher, and so our family's just funny. We'd send whatever videos to each other, and I'm constantly sending him how to stretch out your hips. So there's like, you know, yogis on there or whatever, and I'm just like sending him these TikToks on things that for him, and Morgan likes recipes and travel stuff. And but So if you don't want to create your own video and you're not comfortable in front of the camera, share a TikTok video. Or we can let Brie get TikTok famous and let you, she can, she can start, <laughs> right, right. we can send out our videos. <laughs> but my point is, is let's not get caught up in the perfection or what we think it should be um, or what we think it should look like. Um, or just like the very first thing out of Susan's mouth when I said, oh, I've seen your videos. And what was the very first thing she said? Susan can't say it. Somebody else say it. What was the very first thing she said? Those are... Old. Oh, those are old. Those are from a year. I didn't know that. I actually see her face regularly and I didn't know those were old videos. So people had no idea. Just send it out there, right? And I don't see everything that you all put on social media. I don't see if Kathy posted something Saturday, Sunday, and today. I may only see one of those posts depending on how my feed is, right? So don't be afraid and get caught up on oh, I, I did this already, I shouldn't do that again. A few people may see it again, but everybody isn't going to. So I just think that we need to start focusing on our strengths and the things that we know that we're good at and the things that we know that, um, that we're comfortable with to a certain extent. I'm not saying don't get out of your comfort zone. I want you to, to get out of your comfort zone. But I also want you to stop 
having the analysis paralysis because I think that gets in all of our way. And so that's why it's so difficult when I ask you, have you sat down, uh, be good or be there, being there, yep, so true. Um, when I asked you all earlier about a business plan, it's very hard to have a concrete business plan when you're still caught up on feeling like you aren't already doing things that you need to be doing. So how in the world could I create a business plan if I'm not doing the things right here that I'm supposed to do? Is that, am I close? Does anybody want to share why they don't have a business plan, why they haven't done it? Are you talking about like a GPS or a 411? Yeah, like, a, or, or even just a true business plan. You know, I, I need to, you can have a GPS or a 411, but also if we sat down and looked at your business plan and you said, okay, I need to sell X units or X amount of volume. And in order to do that, I need to close out X amount each month. In order to close out X amount each month, I need to, right? I have that. That's what Perfect. drives me. No worries. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. So, so that's my point is if it's, if it's difficult for us to just think about the daily, what we need to be doing, then I think it's almost impossible for us to think about what things are going to look like a year from now or five years from now. So I feel like we need to stop stuttering and stammering over the daily and stop overthinking it. And, and just the quote that Joe said there is great. Be good or be there. I mean, I used to say it to my kids all the time. You know, they had, they had all these rules when they were little. If you're talking to me, I don't care if you're whining. I don't care what you're, but you need to look me in the eye when you're talking to me, right? When you meet someone, you shake their hand and you shake it like you mean it and you look at them in the eye, right? And they used to get so frustrated with me because they would be mad or upset or whatever. And I would say, say whatever you want to say, but you need to look me in the eye when you say it. Because so many adults have such a difficult time making direct eye contact. It's so uncomfortable for people. And it's become so unusual that when someone does look at you when they're saying something, they automatically appear so much more confident and so much more together. And you want to hear what they have to say. And so I used to tell them all the time, if you just show up, you're going to beat out 90% of your competition. Because you already have these traits and, and these characteristics that most people don't have. So you all just have to think of yourselves in that way. If I just show up, I'm going to beat 90% of them. If I just do an open house this weekend, Lisa Gibbs, I'm going to get two more buyers. So if I'm hearing that, then I'm thinking, I'm going to call Lisa and say, hey, can I come hang with you at your next open house? I'll, I'll bring the food and I won't speak. I won't say a word to anybody. I just want to watch what you do. Right? What if I bring the cookies or I bring the balloons or whatever? Can I come and watch what you do this weekend? Like knowing that she got two out of three people that came into her open house, that's something you want to learn how to do. And then do you have to have a listing to have an open house? So then start going through the office listings. Hey, can I have an open house on your listing this weekend? Right? There are so many things that we can do you all to push ourselves ahead. And so when we think about those five things that a realtor is supposed to be doing, if you don't have appointments to go on, find someone that's going on appointments and follow them. Can I shadow you? Can I sit with you? I'll just sit there and act like your assistant. I'll be very quiet and I'll write and make you look really important. If you'll just let me listen to what you do on a listing appointment, right? I won't say one word. They won't know I'm a realtor, right? Whatever. Just be quiet and take notes for people. But learn. Be moving forward. Be doing something. So just because you don't have an appointment to go on doesn't mean you can't go on one with someone else. Um, and negotiating contracts, you all, that and scripts and role play, so many of the classes and the things that we do, I know for sure anything that Lori has on there, she does the contracts class every month, is just to hear, right? Like hearing even what Nancy was just saying with her buyers this past weekend, how can we constantly be sharpening and increasing our negotiating skills? What are we doing to push ourselves forward? You know, find out when somebody wins out on multiple offers. What do they do? Rachel Alley is a perfect resource for that. You know, what are you doing? I mean, I know there's plenty of people that went out on them, right? But I just know she's taught classes on that before. Um, what are some little things that you do to give your people the upper hand or the edge? What can we do when we're up against 28 other people? You know, are we writing a letter? Are we, you know, what, what do you do to win? And, and find those things out because that's going to help you negotiate 
when the time comes. What are some ahas from today? Go make an appointment. Go canvas the office building on East Wilson Bridge and pass out market. Oh, I closed it. Uh, pass out market data for homes that are for sale or sold in Worthington. Yeah, that's a great idea. You can pull that. You can We can pull that from broker metrics. You all can pull it from, I'm sure, your MLS. Um, that's a great piece. What else? Do what you like to lead Do generate it. so it's consistent. Do what you like. You got to enjoy it, you all. This business is crazy enough, and we've been through crap over the last few months, right? And we're still going through it. So you've got to enjoy it. What else? I need one more aha or everybody consistency. has consistency. Perfect. Consistency. And and that's the thing about being consistent is you either have to see results or really enjoy it. Right? So if we're not seeing the results right away of what we want to see, then we really need to be focusing on our strengths and what we do really well. You know, are you somebody that goes to the lake all the time, Brian Kemp? If you go to the lake all the time, you should be the person, right? Brian, Darcy, whoever these people are, you should own that lake. Everybody that comes to the lake should know you're the realtor, you're the person, right? You enjoy it. You're already there. Don't step out and try to do something different. Do what you're already doing. Are you really into your church? Are you all starting to go back now? You know, everybody at your church should know that you are the realtor. Like just focus on what you already love and what you're already doing instead of putting so much pressure on yourselves to do something different and outside of, of what's already going on. I need to own my senior softball league. Yes, you do, Joe. Yes, you do. Always wear something that shows you're a realtor, right? Something, they need to know that. Uh, something that I had shared a long time ago, uh, probably the beginning of the year in one of our sessions was I used to take cookies and uh, I, I had the carpool lane uh, when my kids were younger and I would tie up cookies in little baggies with a little ribbon around them and I would punch a hole in my business card and I would tie it onto like two little cookies in a bag and I would um, put them in a basket and I would come out at the carpool lane and I would go and knock on doors, knock on the car doors. I'll be like, I had these left over from my open house yesterday. Would you like some? You know, and the parents would take these cookies in the open house lane. I didn't have an open house yesterday. I just made them and took them and passed them out. <laughs> so it's like I was already there. You know, I already had to spend 30 minutes of my day at best sitting in that carpool lane. So work with what you're already doing inst instead of trying to like fight against the current and do something else. Was today helpful at all? Did you get a couple of good yes. ideas? Thank yeah. you. Perfect. So Joe has a lot of beer to buy. Uh, Nancy has a lot of calls to make and some postcards to make. <laughs> Thank you all so much for sharing today. Have a phenomenal rest of the day. You may now call me if you need me because I now have a phone that works. So have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.